Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to, to GEM. I have to confess that I met John and Paul very recently. Uh, I was introduced by, by uh, a common uh, acquaintance, and uh, it's been uh, a pleasure to work with this team. So I, I cannot uh, uh, brag about being engaged for 10 years, but I hope what I will present to you today gives you the enthusiasm that we are trying to build a very interesting partnership and we hope to help GM to become also a standard in the financial services sector. So uh, I come from Global Parametrics, which is a, a financial service company that is uh, headquartered in London. And our business mandate is to develop financial products for emerging markets uh, related to natural disasters. So I, I think uh, we have some uh, members of the industry that are very active in this conversation about the protection gap. And I think you might be very familiar with these uh, numbers that are usually cited. But I think I want to give one dimension that usually is, uh, is not, uh, uh, is overcome when, when discussing the protection gap. When we talk about 90, upward of 90% of people living in what consider vulnerable countries or countries in crisis, there's a very important geographical implication of that. So if we're gonna be serious about working in developing countries and helping the poor and vulnerable population, it's not that we can pick around the globe and say, let's go and work in the easy countries. I mean, if you're gonna be serious, you have to go to those countries. And those countries are usually the ones that have the least data available. But if we're gonna make a difference, and we need to bring this financial technology and financial services for these countries, we need to overcome these constraints with the best to our knowledge, but we don't have the luxury of waiting. I mean, there's a lot of cost of inaction. So the, the, key, the, key, uh, uh, the key mandate that we, we received, we were funded by the British government and the German government was try to innovate and bring these financial services, maybe not at the retail level, but at least at the institutional level for NGOs, for investors, for SMEs that have exposure to natural disasters so they can build financial resilience. So th that is the uh, mandate of global parametrics. It's important to provide you a little bit of context so when I explain what we're trying to do with GEM, it will come back of why, why this partnership is so relevant for us but also for our investors which are these two governments. So in summary, I think what we try to capture in this slide is what we do with clients, so basically in, we engage early on with clients, I'm gonna put an example. So imagine a microfinance network that has uh, subsidiaries in uh, 10, 12 countries and they are very exposed to different kind of natural disasters. So we are hired to go and assess the risk. Uh, when I mean when assess the risk, we have to either build our own models or partner with others that have uh, existing models. So this is why I come back to the, the gym. So we try to Ad, uh, advise these institutions into how to assess the risk. That's the first stage of the uh, engagement. The second part of the engagement is how can you monitor, how, how can you measure, so how can you turn this data into uh, products that are useful for them and, and provide them with monitoring tools also for decision making. So, but the, we also do a third leg, which is basically we also go from data to structuring to actually bring in the financial services So we bring the reinsurance capacity or the capacity from other financial segments to this client. So we bring them from the early assessment all the way for them to be able to buy an insurance-like product. I'm gonna use the word insurance-like product because in a lot of cases, there's not an insurance policy sold to the clients. But you can think about it, these are like wholesale products that I sold to multi-country, to multilateral organization, NGOs, and financial investors. So this is, in a, very, in a nutshell, uh, what we do in terms of client engagement. We cannot stop uh, too much because we are very constrained in time. So I can answer questions if you want after the event. But in terms of how the business is structured, because this is very relevant to when I, I, I discuss what we're trying to do with GM, what you have here is a, a company that has an integrated supply chain, basically. So you have, you have basically uh, the, the first circle uh, on, the uh, on your left talks about a global risk platform. So that this is ev everything on modeling capabilities that either we own and develop ourselves or we partner with third parties. This is basically the engine that you use to assess the risk and to be able to structure solutions. So that's the first part of the integrated supply chain model. 
The second part of the integrated supply chain model is the second circle, which is basically what we call the structure in ourselves. There are professionals that usually come from the either financial services or the insurance markets that can work in these emerging economies, can understand a little bit of what is exposure. We're usually working in countries that are not necessarily assets that are exposed. There can be poor countries that are mostly where you're talking about humanitarian assistance, you're talking about how capital is moved in, 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 in cases of uh, famines or crisis, or you're, you're focusing in uh, business continuity for microfinance institutions that are trying to provide livelihood loans when there is a disaster. This is a kind of client. So the second part of this integrated supply chain model is the people that turn the data into products. But the third, the third part is we actually have a fund and partnerships with insurers so we can provide the product. So basically, we as a company are regulated in, in, uh, by the FCA in London, so we actually can offer financial products to our clients. So basically, it, it is linked to the models that we either develop or we're testing with third parties, but by having this capacity, it allows us to, uh, to build products on technologies that they don't have a, a strong track record or where the reinsurance community hasn't, doesn't have a lot of experience, so we can become an incubator of innovative uh, approaches and you allow these this innovative ways of, of measuring risk and structuring contracts to build a track record, build a portfolio, and you allow then the reinsurance companies to hopefully you crowd them in and you keep innovating. So that's the whole philosophy of global parametrics, which is basically to uh, contribute to this effort of bringing financial solutions to unserved segments or in, in the world. Now, let me talk a little bit about OpenQuake and why it's so important for us. I think uh, we, we in, before we, before I knew John, we've been uh, building a, a hazard model of our own uh, with technology that we acquire, with uh, 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 scientists that, that we brought on board. And we, we developed our own uh, uh, PGA model a little bit with historic footprints. Keep in mind that we're, we're working in, in, not in the countries that most people are working in. We're not working in the US, we're not working in Japan, not in Europe. So even South America so far has been limited. But uh, so we try with our own science, try to move ahead into developing a basic model that allows us to structure products. But then I met Jim. And I realized, and this is something that Dickie Whittaker was mentioning this morning, you get all these big ideas, uh, people that say, we're gonna start doing this, and there's people that started 10 years ago thinking in the same path, and sometimes we don't connect very well and we miss, that is, that's a big, a big challenge, but once we were made aware, I think uh, uh, what I wanna present you now is, is, a, is a work that was done by Malcolm Halo, which is sit sorry, he's sitting here in the audience, so, he was working as our lead scientist and consultant in trying, trying to use the global earthquake model framework to do our own stochastic catalog in South America as a test, because a lot of the model hasn't been released and we wanted to show to John and Paul that uh, we were investing and preparing. Our, our objective is to be able to make GEM a transactional model, basically a model that buyers and sellers can trust and that it, we're hoping in 2019 we can start doing transactions where the actual disbursement mechanism is tied to a GEM model. That's our main objective. So that's how we started by, by doing our stochastic catalog based on the South American model because it was public. And, and I think we, we are starting to market it actually. We're talking with clients, I think we're talking with the market and we found out that a lot of insurers already feel comfortable undergrading it. So from the market side, there's no problem the capacity. On the clients, we see a lot of enthusiasm, and I, I would summarize in a slide, but I have to say that we face a little bit technical difficulties when we were doing this, uh, this stochastic catalog. We're trying to develop 10,000 years, and we had to do it in batches of 1,000 years because of some technical complexity. But if you want to discuss the technical details of uh, our constraints, uh, Malcolm is here, so he led the work. I'm not nearly as technical as him, so I can only talk about the overall challenges. So basically, th that's what we did with the, with the test case. So we calculated this grid box at a 0 0.1 degree by 0 0.1 degree. So we were simulating PGA for 153,000 sites. And uh, this is a little bit the, the outcome of the model, but I think what, what uh, 
what we also wanted to create is this event set, of course, that are the basis for, for risk analysis and, and, and structuring. Uh, but as I say here, we had to split the runs uh, in, in independently. We had a little bit of challenge. So we, we, would, we were not able to solve some parameters, but it was a, a good taste. And I wanted, we wanted to do this work, so we, we came uh, to this presentation with, with the GEM team. We could talk about how to solve it. And, uh, because we, we made the investment, we developed the, the computer code, so basically we can integrate this stochastic catalog in our system. So we're trying to mainstream the relationship with, with the uh, uh, GEM outputs. So some technical challenges, but as you can see, the, the PGA maps look reasonably well. And if you compare it to our own models, of course, uh, one of the things that you can see is not surprisingly, the uncertainty estimates our, our model was l less robust. We were trying to use the, the best access to historic uh, 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 event uh, uh, databases. But once we incorporated the GEM model and compared with our model, as you can see, the uncertainty cones that you can measure were, were more, more compressed. So not surprisingly, GEM, because of the robust work that our colleagues have done, it was far superior than anything else we could, we could either acquire or hire or collaborate at a global scale, particularly in the countries that we were interested. But again, if you want to delve into how we estimated the uncertainty cones and compare it to our own, uh, I would encourage you to talk with Malcolm directly. Uh, so the, the key messages I want to, I just want to summarize this. What we have seen from people, when we go to clients in developing countries and we say, would you be open to a solution based on, on GEM model? And then a lot, of, a lot of our clients, of course, they're not familiar with it. But once you, they start to learn about the open, the open uh, uh, platform, I think the other thing that is a big selling point is when you start to explain to them how the local agencies are involved. That builds a lot of confidence. So uh, in all the conversations that we have right now, we have around four or five. We, would, we promised uh, Jim that we will try to have at least one or two so we can test this and make it a real transactional example. Uh, people are reacting very well, not only to the, the technical part, but the, the storyline about what Jim represents uh, the type of, of collaborator they have, the network, it, it, it plays very well. So we think that with that in mind, we are committed to continue investing uh, with GM, hopefully in other regions of the world, market it, and hopefully do some financial transaction based on the GM model. So I will stop here, thank you. Thank you. Uh, time for a couple of questions. <laughs> Not there yet. Oh, there is one. There's a microphone coming from there. Edmund Booth, I'm a structural engineer from the UK, so I don't understand the insurance market. But are the products that you're developing, are they, are they suitable for subsistence farming communities in, in Indonesia, for example? And, and if so, how do they differ from, from what you're offering or what the insurance industry would be offering in Japan? So basically, as I, as I was explaining, we're not working at the retail level. So the example, uh, if you look at the press release in The Economist in January, it talks about a program called ARDIS, which is basically uh, a program that has been mainstreamed through the microfinance community. It is through a partner called Vision Fund International. So the product uh, that we design it's basically all the subsidiaries that are owned by, by, the, by the mother company, Vision Fund International US. Basically what they do is they pay 50 basis points of their portfolio to the, to the mother company and they have access to a program that has three legs. The first leg is our data, just for planning purposes. So we, we are in six countries, two in Asia and two in Africa. In the countries in Africa, we're providing monitoring tools for drought in Myanmar, it's tropical cyclone. In, in Cambodia's drought, it will be flawed. So it, it, this, this is the part where the, the financial intermediary is used to assign credits and look at their exposure. There's a second part of the program that is a contingent credit provided by the German government. And this, this, this contingent credit is, is also triggered on our data. And this is to allow the, the subsidiaries to, to provide emergency recovery loans. So it's not an insurance product. 
is basically the microfinance providing a recovery lending product. And DFID has done a great job in monitoring the social impact of this program in Philippines and in Asia, and, and the numbers are outstanding. Recovery rates for microfinance are very, very powerful, but also the fidelity of these clients. So, it, so it's not an insurance product. So that part is, is triggered by a continuing credit. And the third part, which is what Global Paramedics provide, paramet, Parametrics provides as insurance, this insurance is, 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 is bought by the mother, who is basically access to money so they can provide liquidity to the subsidiary. It's, uh, it's actually not passed as insurance, it's passed as a convertible loan, basically, to allow the business continuity and, and strengthening the balance sheet of the microfinance. So we, we don't operate through the traditional insurance supply chain. We've been asked to, to go after the big numbers. So we're trying to, to target the institutions that have a large footprint in emerging markets, where they can use financial engineering, they can use insurance, but they're not necessarily insurance company. And actually, most, if you, if you really look at who is actually present in poor and vulnerable areas, the insurance sector doesn't have a competitive advantage as a distribution system. So we try to provide this, 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 this access to contingent financing through different channels.